Hello and welcome to the uh, Positive Behavioral Intervention Supports Strategies for Supporting Your Child's Learning at Home webinar series. Uh, this is a second, uh, second webinar in the series of three and today we'll be talking about PBIS expectations and rules. Um, I'm Stacey Willison. I'm a consultant with the Michigan Department of Education, Office of Special Education, and I support the Michigan Alliance for Families, who is, a, a, is collaborating, collaborating on this project with uh, MIMTSS. And I also support the Michigan, um, the Statewide Autism Resources and Training Project, or START, out of Grand Valley State University. Um, I am also a private uh, clinician that ha having worked with young children and elementary age children and uh, preteens and clinics and schools and homes and um, now uh, primarily uh, work in my private practice with um, young adults and teens and social skills interventions and uh, preparing for for work work based settings. Um, I have a 15 year old with autism spectrum disorder um, with Asperger's, and I also have a 20 year old that is does not have a disability. Um, I'm the the representative um, parent representative on the Michigan Autism Council, and also serve on a number of statewide committees on transition and um, and other projects to uh, help improve the uh, outcomes uh, for individuals with disabilities. Hi, and I'm Stephanie Dyer. Uh, I'm a school psychologist by training. I've worked in urban and rural districts and ISDs around the state of Michigan. Um, I've also worked as a special ed administrator, an autism coordinator, and a behavior specialist. And like Stacy, I've, um, I've sat on a number of committees at the state level around early childhood uh, and different um, focus areas in autism spectrum disorder. Uh, I currently work for Michigan's um, Multi-Tiered System of Support Technical Assistance Center, or my MTSS, uh, which is a state and federally funded project to help ISDs and uh, local school districts implement a multi-tiered system of support to improve student outcomes in both behavior and learning. Um, I also work for um, a Michigan Department of Education grant project called START which is the statewide autism resources and training project um, which provides intensive training technical assistance and coaching um, to isd district and school based teams in the evidence-based practices um, to support students with asd and other extensive learning needs So as we get started, um, I would like to just do a couple of acknowledgements. And um, one is the My MTSS Technical Assistance Center that's helping support this, uh, this webinar series. And the other is Michigan Alliance for Families. Uh, Michigan Alliance for Families has a really robust webpage with a lot of resources related to special education topics for parents. Um, Michigan Alliance has, has parent mentors throughout the state that support families and questions and issues related to special education. So I encourage you to take a look at their website and I'll uh, bring that up later so I can give you a little bit more detail on that. But there's a lot of information that could benefit families. Um, like to also acknowledge all Michigan educators, staff, um, and uh, teachers as we, as we go back to school and, and transition back this fall and um, also the families and students as they return to fall um, to school this fall in whatever format that might look like. So just wanted to cover some quick objectives for today. Um, we'd like to increase your knowledge um, of developing um, expectations and rules. Um, also increase your knowledge on using core values um, for your families in establishing some of these home expectations that uh, Stephanie will talk about. Um, we want to increase your knowledge for teaching expectations and rules through communication um, and the tools that are available. And we'll talk more about those. So looking at the agenda, um, we'll do another brief overview um, just to, to review on uh, PBIS and routines. I will also cover the purpose, development, and use of expectations and rules and teaching expectations and rules. We'll also discuss resources um, for getting more information of, um, about setting up expectations and creating rules and implementing them at home. And we'll deliver a brief survey towards the end of the discussion today um, and talk about next steps and things for you to consider as um, while developing expectations uh, at home and, and your educational setting or professional setting or whatever setting that might be. Um, 
I also wanted to know, to mention if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If you have questions, we will send out the question and responses and a frequently asked questions after the session, along with links and, the, and uh, to, to resources that we covered today and uh, the PowerPoint and some other items. So, um, so we talked about last time about returning to school and what that might look like. And at this point, most of our kids have returned to some form of learning. Um, with some, you know, and, and with that comes some excitement, anticipation, maybe fear, uncertainty. Um, and uh, like I said, it just it, it depends on the, the setting your child is in um, as to what that looks like. So we talked about um, how important it is to set, set up those routines and transitioning back. And we hope that you were able to find a simple routine in your home and, and to think about that and hopefully start setting it up and, and getting that going. There are different needs and requirements depending on the setting your child's in. Um, we also know that based on, our, based on the discussion in our last um, webinar, the importance of routines. And we'll talk now more and equally important about defining expectations in your home. And um, then how to teach your child how to meet those expectations through setting rules. And Steph, I'll turn it over to you now. Alrighty. So here's our webinar series in uh, which we are talking about foundations of PBIS and how to set up uh, safe and predictable environments at home. Um, last time we talked about routines and today we're gonna talk about how to prevent challenging behavior through the development of uh, expectations and rules and the teaching of expectations and rules. Um, on September 16th, our next webinar, the third in the series, uh, we'll continue our discussion of teaching expected behavior um, in using reminding, rewarding, and reinforcing um, in order to um, ensure that that behavior um, is demonstrated in the future. Um, and we'll also discuss if and when challenging behavior does occur, how to correct it, reduce it, or replace it with a more appropriate behavior. So we're gonna do first do a really quick review of our uh, webinar from two weeks ago. Um, we first talked about the foundations of positive behavioral interventions and supports or PBIS. Uh, PBIS involves preventing challenging behavior by changing the environment to set kids up for success. Uh, it also involves actually teaching the behavioral expectations, much like we teach reading or math, rather than just expecting um, that kids should just know how to do that. PBIS is also about responding to behavior, uh, responding to the behavior we want to see more of by recognizing, rewarding, and reinforcing it so that we increase the chances of seeing that positive behavior again. So we can remember what PBIS is about with these three words, prevent, teach, respond. Prevent, teach, respond. So wherever you are right now, uh, just say it out loud with me. We want it to imprint. So prevent, teach, respond. Okay, now the other thing we talked about in the last webinar, as Stacy mentioned, was setting up routines in our homes. Um, so let's quickly review the reasons why routines are really important. Um, one is that recall that routines provide structure and predictability and consistency, which creates that sense of safety and support for all of us, especially our, our kids. Um, secondly, because routines are predictable, they help reduce anxiety and stress. And routines also can become the manager of the behavior, not you, not me. Um, routines just create a, this is just how we do business kind of condition in our home, and that then governs the behavior. So to get us started, we have a poll for you. Um, and our friend Melissa will pop that up. And what we're asking here, if you could check all that apply, which routines have you started to develop and use in your home? Maybe just even since the last webinar. I'll give you a couple minutes, check all that you want. As soon as those results roll in, Melissa will 
put the results up on the screen for us to see. Here we go. We can see, oh, lots of people have started to do a bedtime routine. Awesome. And a morning routine. Those are huge. Starting our day and ending our day well is really important. Meals, that's a great one. And online and remote learning, that's kind of a necessity right now, isn't it? So, so good. More than half of you have started to do that. Really good. Thank you so much for sharing. And I hope that you're finding value in those routines. Okay. So um, today, in today's webinar, like we said, we are focusing on developing and teaching behavioral expectations in the home. So in order to give you a better idea of what we mean by behavioral expectations, just so we're all on the same page, here's a short video that describes um, expectations in an elementary school setting. Get this pulled up. Again, it was just intended to uh, get us all on the same page with what, what we mean by expectations. So as you could see in the video, um, expectations are three to five broad, positively stated um, values, uh, we call them expectations, but they align with the values and behavioral concepts that are held important in a school and its community. And you can set expectations that align with the values in each of our homes. Um, expectations in the school communicate, these are the behaviors that the school wants to see all staff and students displaying, plus they let students know how to be successful. And we can do the same thing in our homes to communicate the behaviors we wanna see and show our kids how to be successful in our home. Um, expectations also give us a consistent language for all school staff and students and they also can create a consistent language within our homes too. So if you look at the two pictures on the right, um, the top picture is from a few years ago, but it is from Martin Luther King Jr. Academy in Detroit. And if you notice that the five uh, expectations they have is that I am determined, I am respectful, I am engaged, I am achieving, I am motivated. And if you notice the, the acronym is DREAM, which is so fitting for the values of that school. Um, the bottom picture is from a high school and we can again see immediately what's important to this school community by viewing these expectations of self control on task as s acts responsibly and respectful. And so you can almost picture the climate of those schools based on the values that they've deemed important. Um, so why is it so important that we have these behavioral expectations in school and and now today talking about them in our homes. So there's really three reasons we're going to talk about. The first is to provide clarity. So as a parent, have you ever had days where your kids could really kind of do whatever they wanted, nothing was really bugging you, right? They could be loud, they could be messy, they could be arguing, and uh, you were just rolling with it. I mean, I sure have. Um, maybe you also had days, I know I have, where every little thing was a major offense. Like maybe you didn't get good sleep or maybe you're not feeling good or you're a little bit more stressed out, which is pretty common right now. But for whatever reason, the kids can't do anything right at this moment. And again, I, I have definitely lived that. So, but how confusing for kids that one day they can run around the house loudly and the next day they can't make a peep without getting in trouble. And this happens for te with teachers in schools as well. You know, we're all human. Um, but without clear expectations, it leaves kids to try to figure it out by trial and error, which often results in a lot of confusion about their behavior. So have you ever had your, your child stare at you all confused and, 
like, why am I in trouble? Or sometimes they'll even be like, what? <laughs> like, because they don't, they really don't know. So clarity is needed. Um, another reason to develop expectations is for consistency. So we have teacher A who allows kids to work together on assignments and teacher B, students are expected to work independently. Or um, when my son was home, for example, he would get in trouble with his dad when he would dribble the basketball in the house or throw the football in the house where I didn't really care and, and I allowed it. So again, inconsistency results in kids getting in trouble, um, but more importantly, feeling picked on or feeling personally singled out in it also creates a situation where they learn the loopholes, right? So if mom lets me play like fighting kind of video games on the computer, but dad only lets me play educational games, who am I gonna go to when I wanna play computer games? I'm gonna learn to go ask mom, right? So we wanna make sure we're setting kids up for success behaviorally, and so that requires consistency. And the last reason we have listed here for having expectations for behavior is that when we have expectations, now the behavior becomes teachable. Uh, without defining our expectations, how do we teach our kids to display the behavior that we want them to have? So um, just one quick example, I sometimes work with a middle school student and he has challenges understanding and navigating all the social nuances uh, that we have in our world. And he's learning how to adjust his behavior and follow the expectation of the context he's in, but only if the expectations are really clear. He just can't figure it out very successfully, as many kids can't. Um, and I wouldn't know what to teach him to do or how to do it unless those expectations were defined. So once they're clear, we can teach, we can practice, and then kids have half a chance of being successful uh, in, in different contexts. So let's talk about how to do this. So here's some steps to developing expectations at home. First, define your core family values. Just think about what is really important to you and your family. Um, what characteristics or traits or values define who you are as a family? Next, find out what school-wide expectation your child's school might already be using, um, like maybe safe, responsible, respectful. And decide which three to five positively expectations you want between your own values and maybe what the school is using. Uh, sometimes families just choose the one that are in their child's school. Um, other times families choose something very specific and meaningful to them, such as, you know, we Williams are helpful, respectful, and give our best effort. Um, to help out with that, this is just an example of a list of core values. It's certainly not a comprehensive list, but it provides examples of different values for parents and families to consider. And you can just Google core value lists actually and get many, many choices. Um, one way to decide what values or characteristics might become your three to five expectation is to have all family members uh, choose their top five from a list and then everyone can discuss and narrow it down and, and vote on that. Um, some families just know right away what they want for their expectations. Uh, one family that I knew had really young children, and so they used Disney characters, Disney princesses actually, to represent different traits and values so that their kids could better participate in the process. Um, and in other families, like the one in the video we saw during our first webinar, those parents just set up the expectations and then, and then shared them with the children. So it's completely up to you how you like to do that. Okay. Now, once you have the, the three to five expectations, it's time to define them. So having be respectful is great, but what does that mean? What does it look like? What behaviors demonstrate respect? And it's probably different from what you think to what your child thinks. So we have to define it, and we often use a chart that's called a behavior matrix. So here's a school example. Notice in the left column that this school's expectations are be respectful, res be responsible, be safe. And across the top, they listed the various settings or routines in the school, like classroom, cafeteria, and um, dismissal. And um, then what they did is they defined, let's start with respectful. What does respectful look like in the classroom? What does respectful look like in the cafeteria? What does it look like during dismissal? And they did the same for responsible and safe. So let's test this out. So what does respectful look like in the cafeteria? You can see in the school that they define that as throwing your food away when you're done eating. Sometimes those definitions you see in those middle cells um, are sometimes referred to as rules. 
and Stacy will talk more about those. So here's an example of a behavior matrix for the home. So notice that this family decided to stay with the be respectful, be responsible, and safe for their broad expectations. And you can see across the top that this home has three routines. They have one for the virtual classroom, they have one for mealtime, and one for bedtime. And now we can also see how they defined the expectations in those routines. So for example, what does be responsible look like at mealtime? In this home, they defined it or created a rule that it means you wash your hands before you help with meal prep or eating and eating. And what does it mean to be safe during virtual class? Again, in this family, the expectation or rule is that everyone keeps open drinks away from the computer keyboard. Okay, so how do you get started on this? If you want to want to do this, how, how do you get going? Um, first, list the three to five expectations that you decide in that first column in the matrix. This home you can see has kind to self, kind to others, and kind to our home as their expectations. Um, as part of the resource materials that we um, will be providing for you today or out of today, uh, we have a couple templates and that might help you with this. But honestly, you can take a blank piece of paper and you can draw a grid on it. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, next, you'll list the routines that you have going on in your home across the top. And you can see right now this family has a get ready in the morning routine. They have a rem remote instruction routine and a completing homework routine established so far. So what you do next is you work to fill in the cells for each routine. So for example, let's look at the remote instruction uh, routine. In thinking about the routine that this family set up in their home for remote instruction, what would be kind to self look like? What they determined is that it means setting up a quiet learning space with materials that you need and staying focused. What does uh, kind to others look like in remote instruction in this family? It means that you're actively listening, and I might um, even define that further. What does that look like? Um, muting yourself when not talking and taking turns when working in groups. And then lastly, this family defined being kind to our home during remote instruction as putting away supplies after class and keeping the working area clean. So if this was your home, you might define it differently, and that's okay. That's okay. This has to reflect your own expectations in your home. Okay, so um, while you can certainly set up your own three to five expectations and rules, and we want them to, again, reflect your home and your value and what's important to you, uh, there are some important features to consider when you're doing this. Um, you wanna try to keep everything in the matrix positively stated, meaning we wanna tell kids what to do, not what not to do. So I, most of you can probably relate to this. If you say no running to a child, they, they'll stop running, but now all of a sudden they're hopping, right? And then we say, well, no hopping, and now all of a sudden they're galloping. And then we get frustrated because they're not following our directions when actually they are. <laughs> we didn't tell them what to do. We told them what to stop doing, leaving them a broad variety of things they could do. So stating what to do versus what not to do avoids that whole scenario, and it teaches them exactly what we're expecting. We also want to be able to picture what each expectation looks like during each routine. So we want to write it as clear as possible so everyone in the family visualizes them the same. So for example, if on my home matrix I write put books and materials into the desk drawer, that's easier for everyone in my home to have the same mental picture of what that looks like than if I had just wrote clean up. Um, we also want to make sure the expect, um, expectations give some sense for criteria of did I do this right? Did I, did I do it correctly? So using that last example I just gave, if I put my books and material in the desk drawer, I know I did it right because that's exactly what it said. But if it just said clean up, I'm not really sure. Like, did I do it right? Was there more things I was supposed to clean up? I'm not, I'm not completely sure. Um, a couple other things to keep in mind is the expectations should be specific to the setting or routine. So I'm going to go back to this example for a minute. And if you look in the remote instruction, if I can get there, we go. Um, mute yourself when, when not talking is specific to being kind to others in the remote learning, remote instruction routine. But notice that muting yourself when not talking is not part of being kind to others during the, the morning routine. Right, so some of these are very specific to the type of routine that you have in place. 
And then ways to discourage uh, challenging behavior. I love this one because this is like free prevention. Um, for example, if we go back to this matrix, and if you look in the complete homework column, um, one of the things about being kind to self is asking for help if you need it. This having this expectation there discourages challenging behavior. Um, many of you have probably, and, my, and myself included, have worked with kids who when they need help because they're stuck, they might throw paper on the floor and, and get frustrated and, and might yell, I hate this, and then we get behavior. This matrix tells us exactly what to do. If you need help, you, you can ask for it. That's our expectation. So prevention is built right in, which is fabulous. Okay. Um, another example um, of a home uh, matrix is, is shown on the screen here. And, and I just show you this so that it can just kind of broaden your mind in terms of what they can look like and what the routines are. So this family's matrix went with safe, respectful, and responsible to align with their school. But notice their routines and settings are different than the other matrices we just looked at. They have all the time. They have some, some rules that they want displayed all the time. They have rules around iPads and TV time and chores and exercise and, and, and uh, learning. So just another um, example for you. And there's a link at the bottom of this slide um, that you'd be able to access this if you wanted to. Okay, so as I wrap up expectations and, and kick it over to Stacy to talk about how to teach these, um, one common question in our current COVID context of remote and online learning is how do we connect, if I make a home behavioral uh, expectation matrix, how do I connect this to the online learning one that my children are getting from school? Um, and so I just wanted to show you one idea, one example of how you could do that. So notice that this family's home matrix has a routine for online class. So as a family, they've decided that these are the things we expect in our home um, when you are online um, for school. So they have the expectations of be helpful, be responsible, and in being engaged. And they've defined what that looks like in their home when they're online. So you can see it's about keeping background noise to a minimum. Um, they want, also want drinks kept away from the computer. That's probably a pretty common expectation. <laughs> um, they also want their kids to stay focused and do their best work. And so they've built that into their home matrix. But in this example, their, their children's teachers each um, also have an online class matrix for their class that includes be respectful, be responsible, and be safe. It's different from the home expectations. Um, and so what this family did to, to connect it is they simply wrote, follow your class expectations matrix as part of what is being responsible at home during online class. So now we have two separate matrices that, that have separate expectations, but now have that nice connection. All right, and so we are going to do one more poll and then we will move forward. So this poll is creating expectations in my home would help my children better understand what is expected and would help us be more consistent. If you could just choose one, that would be great. I feel anticipation, waiting to see the results. Oh, yes, definitely. Awesome. And then I think so. Good, thank you. That's that's nice to know. And um, what we're going to do now is move forward now that you understand what expectations are and see the value in them. Now Stacy's going to um, talk about how to teach those. Good, thanks, Steph. That's awesome results on the on the poll too. So now that Stephanie's talked about um, why expecta expectations are important and, and related them to routines, so you could kind of see how that fell out the behavior mat matrix and then the rules that are within the matrix to help support the expectations and routines, we'll talk about then uh, teaching those rules. So, um, and again, how that relates to expectations and um, routines. So uh, often it, it requires some pretty intentional teaching. 
So, um, so let's talk about um, what actually performing these expectations look like. So making them operational within the, within the rules related to the expectations. So there's some steps for establishing rules related to expectations, and we're going to walk through these. So the first one we have here is visually displaying the expectations and rules in your home and, and why that's important. It's usually in a common area and it would be important to post them in an area where the rules are relevant, right? And where they're expected. So for example, posting in areas for online learning, we might want to post rules around online learning. So the rules should be reviewed daily um, and reviewing those expectations and, and what's expected as far as, as delivering on those rules could be part of your morning routine, it could be part of your evening routine, but to making, to making sure that it's intentionally reviewed um, with, with your child. Um, you should mention the rule your child is following and reinforce the behavior as they're doing, as they're following the rule or the expectation. So for example, with the expectation for online learning, um, the rule may be logging in 10 minutes before class starts. And so you might say, thank you for getting logged into your computer 10 minutes before your class starts. You'll be all set to go. Um, if you see your child is not following the rule, you could prompt them with what you want to see. So for example, you might say, Allie, being responsible means being logged into your computer and ready for class on time. So you need to turn off the television and log into your computer so you're ready to go and prepared when class starts. So, and I know Stephanie covered some of the rules for, for school, and this is just a kind of a different visual the way it's laid out. Um, it's, it's about being safe in the school hall. So the first expectation of her being safe um, is walking safely in the hall with your eyes forward. So that's the rule related to the expectation. The expectation of, expectation of respect is defined by um, the rule of walking quietly with keeping your hands at your side. And finally, the expectation of being responsible can be just demonstrated by the rule of carrying your things directly from your class or to your locker. So as you can see, these rules are defined specifically related to the expectations and define what being safe means in that in the school hall in that context. So here are a few examples of house rules um, related to expectations. So in this example, we consider expectations of being respectful, responsible and helpful at home and then some of the rules um, related to those expectations. So being responsible might mean sitting on the couch. It means drawing, um, only drawing on the paper on the desk or at the desk. It means sitting down to eat. How being helpful means cleaning up your own messes. It means turning off lights when you leave a room. Um, being respectful means using kind words um, and asking before you take or use other people's things. So remember your home are your rules, right? So these are examples that, that are kind of universal, but the rules that you have in your home would be specific um, to how your home runs and is set up. So, so now we're gonna look at how to teach rules. When we're teaching rules, there's an order we kind of um, we, we move in to assure that there's understanding of what that rule is. And you may have heard the phrase, is it a can't do or is it a won't do? So if the child does not have the skills, no matter how many times you ask, no matter what your expectations are, it doesn't matter what your routines are, how good your visuals or your strategies are, if they can't do it, they can't do it. So it'd be like someone asking me to speak Spanish. I, I have no idea how to speak Spanish. I can count to 10. But if it's outside of that, there's nothing else I, I could contribute to that, right? So you could promise me anything and ask me to, to, to say a sentence in Spanish. I couldn't do it. So we want to make sure that they have the skills, right, to do what we're asking them to do and to be able to follow the rules. So your child may understand a rule by, some children might, you might be able to just explain it and they'll get it, but, but many would need supports, additional supports to really comply with that rule. So here's some things we would do to teach and I'll touch on these and we'll look at them more specifically here in upcoming slides. So we wanna clearly explain what the rule is and the behavior we expect to see and how to do the skill for following the rule. Then we'll look at modeling the behavior, which means showing the child how to do the skill. When we practice a skill and give feedback to the child um, to help them learn the skill, and we definitely wanna recognize the effort that, in their, that they're performing um, in a positive way. So that's through verbal praise and maybe it's reward systems or re some other form, of, some form of reinforcement that we have in place. And we will discuss this more um, at the upcoming presentation um, in, on September 16th. So, but we do wanna touch on it here too. 
So next we're gonna talk, um, we talked about last time about routines are a great way, right? To provide a visual, visual schedules and checklists and ways to help with transitions and preparing for, day, for the day or changes and, and different routines we have in our home. Um, we've now talked about some of the expectations and rules and how um, teaching rules are important. And, and the first step is supporting rules and expectations. So clearly explaining the rule as it relates to the expectation is the first, is really the first strategy we want to talk about. Um, we'll look at several other visual type-based type strategies that we can be helpful in supporting teaching the rule. This is, um, uh, this is something that parents can ask their teachers about. They can talk with um, their, their class, how their classroom is run, what kind of strategies they're using to support their child in the, in the, in the um, classroom too, that they may be able to, to provide similar rules and, and expectations at home. So the visual reminders posted um, of the rules specifying the expected behavior. Um, we'll talk about first then charts, um, choices, timers, and then I just wanted to reiterate the importance of really keeping focused on the, the, the interests of the child um, and how that can be so motivating to the child. And it, it, um, it, it becomes kind of a natural type of re reinforcement and motivator. So and remember to use, and just remember to use them as reinforcement too. Um, in your reward system. And then just keeping the learning fun, there's lots of great opportunities for um, supporting learning through just kind of natural things we do, whether it's, it's watching a television show together and, and talking about um, some of the nonverbal language going on on, a, on, the, on the screen with, with favorite characters or something. There's just lots of things that we can do to, um, to encourage that learning at home around your child's interest. So now we'll talk about, um, I wanted to provide this example for a young child. Um, when we teach a rule, we want to communicate what the behavior looks like. So again, it's how to, to follow that rule. We want to set them up for success um, right from the beginning. And in this example, um, which would maybe be for a younger child, we would say, use nice words. This is a situation where we have to ask, does the child really know what that means? Um, do they know what, what nice words mean? And when we say use, use nice words, we want that to be meaningful, right? We want that to be functional for them. So sometimes we make assumptions about whether children know how to use words and, and that they know the meaning, meaning of words because we use maybe these, these terms every day. So in passing, or um, it may be part of our, our regular vernacular, but we make these assumptions. So let me just give you a quick personal example. So I, I mentioned that I have a 15 year old with ASD, um, with Asperger's. So, um, I make a lot of assumptions, right? Smart kid, and I that that he's picking things up, and um, and typically he does. But one day we were cleaning up after dinner, and I said, "Hey, can you put away, you know, the leftovers and cover it?" And he's like, "Well, where's the tarp?" And I'm like, "The tarp?" And I'm like, "What the heck is a tarp?" And he goes, "Well, you know, the tarp that goes over the food." And all this time we've been saying, you know, we we use it, we call it foil, or we call it saran wrap or plastic wrap, and um, I just made the assumption that he knew what foil was, right? That when that he just cover it. So, um, so j just as a point of illustration, sometimes we just make those assumptions. We do this as parents, we do it as educators. Um, and it's easy to kind of to just to think that that they're they know what we're talking about. So it's really good to assess that and make sure that they they have the knowledge. So in this example, the rule is we use nice words. I want to stress here, nice words may be different in different homes, right? So parents would need to adjust their specific you know, to their specific values and what, what they would consider appropriate. So first we'll explain that the rule means it's when we use words that make other people feel good, maybe in a way that's kind or showing that we care about other people. Um, it makes other people happy and friends want to be, want to spend time with us if we're, if we're, if we use nice words, right? And we're nice to them. So then we can give them some examples of what that means using like an emphasis, um, using emphasis, like giving examples. So we may say, um, it's when we say please or thank you or excuse me or I'm sorry, I'm frustrated, I need to go to the bathroom, I don't understand the assignment, will you give me, will you explain it more so I understand it. So those are using kind or nice words. Then we get, want to give them some examples of what it doesn't mean, right? So maybe screaming no or shouting shut up or you're bothering me or that's stupid or I hate you. And these are words that we don't, that as a family, we don't, this is not part of our value system and we want to stay away from. 
So, um, and then we can use tools such as visuals to support, you know, as we're, as we're clarifying what this means for them as we're teaching them. So we can show situations of being nice or kind or through displays um, of pictures and videos or social narratives. Um, on this next, um, on the next slide, we have just a brief video that um, it, it relates to using nice words. And um, what we want to make sure we do prior to showing, showing the video is just as I mentioned earlier, we wanna make sure we really clarify what nice words mean, what it means and what it doesn't mean. So let's go ahead and show the video stuff. Can't hear it stuff. I unmute if you can hear it. When you use nice words, your teachers will feel happy and your friends will want to play with you. Sometimes you might feel angry at school and find it hard to use nice words. When you use bad words that people don't like to hear, it makes others feel sad or scared. Other children might think that you are being rude and may not want to play with you. You will feel sad or angry if other children don't want to play with you. Using nice words when you are frustrated will help you to solve the problem so that you can feel better. Everyone feels safe and happy when you use nice words. You can solve problems with nice words and that makes your teacher feel happy too. So this is just an example of a video that might support your teaching of using nice words. Um, and after you play a video like that, you can revisit concepts from the video. You, you know, you may need to adjust to the age or ability of the child, but maybe one or two questions related to the video, like, how can we help school friends want to play with us? Um, and we would hope they would say using nice words. If they don't, you can prompt them along, right? So what kind of words would we want to use if we want friends to play with us? So, and then again, we're trying to prompt that nice words, right? So, or do we want to use nice words or not nice words? So we want to make it, we want to end it on a, on a, in a scenario where the, the child, you know, we can, we can reinforce that child for, yes, we want to use nice words, or that's right, friends want to play with us if we use nice words. So we just want to really make sure we're praising them for um, the effort and, and that on a positive note. So as you come up with rules, you can make short videos yourself. You can find, sometimes find them on YouTube or, or and honestly with phones, you can make them very quickly um, on your own. So, um, so the next strategy we'll talk about is teaching, uh, for teaching is visually displaying these rules. And this is especially important when rules may be new or difficult. So the way we use them is we wanna make sure that the visuals are big enough to be seen, right? We want to make sure the child sees them. They, um, they, should be, they should be of pictures or words or maybe a combination, combination paired together, again, depending on the need and ability of your child. Um, they should be displayed at eye level where they can be seen and in an area where they might need the rule. So we don't wanna post them too high or too low or off in a corner. We want them to be right within eye level for them to see and be reminded. So the rule should fit the setting. So you wouldn't necessarily post a rule for making for this child making his bed in the basement where his toys are. We'd want that in the bedroom. So as we discussed um, repeatedly, again, this is more of a proactive approach, um, which we can we hope to institute to to reduce unwanted behaviors. So the example of this little boy um, relating to to this visual display, instead of saying you left your toys in the living room, so you need to put them away. Um, we're letting the child self-manage this by seeing that visual prompt and then picking up the toys, right? If this is the case, then you could display a picture of your child picking up the toys with the phrase under it, remember to pick up your toys, such as it's on the screen. 
And, um, and you can also remind them, right? When they get started playing, you can point, you can gesture to the, to the picture and say, hey, remember to pick up your toys, or you've got five minutes, remember to pick up your toys. And you can point to the, point, point to the picture. So this is an example of teaching maybe an older child involved in an online learning situation to complete in-class assignments and clearly explaining the rule. We want them to stay engaged for maximum learning. So we might say, to be responsible for online learning, we really need to complete all of our in-class assignments. And that's one of your rules and your expectations and routines chart. So then we can present the why it's important. Um, it's important to finish your assignments because it helps you know the material it helps you be ready for tests, do your homework, and also be part of the group and in, 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 group, in group assignments. So, and if we look at the next page here, um, this is maybe an illustration of what that could look like. So in this example, we're using a visual posted on the teen's computer, specifying those rules. So, we, so to um, get your classroom assignments, in-class assignments done, you need to, number one, answer all the questions on the assigned worksheets. Number two, you need to take part in all group discussions by following the teacher's instructions. Number three, you need to ask the teacher questions if you don't understand something. And then number four, you need to submit those worksheets when the class ends. So that's very clear and, and um, when it's posted right on the computer next to them. So that's just one illustration. So the next area that, um, next strategy we'll talk about is the first then charts. Um, and it's to have, this really means having a less desired activity followed by a more desired activity. So when visually displayed, they could, this can be really powerful. Um, first then boards or cards, or, and they come in electronic applications too that can use pictures of the individual, it can use text, um, drawings, uh, or a combination of them to, um, to put on the chart. So in this case, the expectation is being responsible. And the rule is finishing reading or math. So we also need to find something motivating for them to work for and we can use to reinforce like the reading or math. So this will definitely vary based on your child and their interest and what motivates them. So if the items have no value to the child, they likely won't do the reading and they don't, they, um, if, they don't if they don't have access to a preferred item afterwards. So um, in the example of the math, um, the math, um, uh, then iPad that's in text and that might be for an older child. So the second example is reading with a picture of the child themselves reading and then they would have access to the, um, the switch. So and in this case, I noted that there are 15 minutes under where, underneath that you could put actually in the then um, column to let them know that there's a time frame, especially if it's something they enjoy and then they have to transition back to something maybe that's less preferred. We wanna make sure and put some sort of a time frame around it. This is another option um, of using choices. Um, so choices are a great strategy to teach, um, to teach, to teach skills and to get buy-in. Um, it also can motivate a child when they have um, options that they can pick from. So it helps them be accountable. They have agreed to one of the choices. So this is more buying a, or more buy-in and onus of making that choice. You can use pictures, text, or compare them together too. So the, the key thing here is limiting the choices um, that limit it to two that you can live with. Otherwise children can get overwhelmed. Um, and it's it, if there are too many things to pick from. So you can also um, provide highly preferred and less preferred, preferred choices when you're teaching to make choices. So sometimes they don't even know how to make a choice. So giving them something super, super, in, they're super interested in and something they're not, yeah, that's a great choice. So you're kind of teaching that skill. Um, and this is also a skill that starts very early. Um, it's a life skill. Making choices is a life skill for all of us. And this can lead to problem solving skills and more complex skills as a child learns how to do it. So, and there's just an example on the screen. Um, so next we'll talk about timers. Um, and these are another great visual strategy for putting context or meaning around time. It can be from transitioning to activities, um, making things more predictable. Timers provide children with a sense of how long a task might take. Um, they can be useful for both preferred and non-preferred tasks. So for preferred tasks, it's saying, hey, it's gonna end in this time, so we need to transition out of this. 
So, um, and hopefully that helps prevent a behavior. And it also can put some time, some, some context around something that's non-preferred. So they know that this isn't gonna go on forever and there's an end to it. So, and this is something a child can be directly involved in too. They can set the timer, they can um, pick the timer that they wanna use. Um, some kids have preferences, right? And there's lots of options for timers. So um, modeling is another area that um, is an evidence-based strategy based on social learning theory for um, learning skills and behaviors. So in this step, we'll talk about teaching rules. Modeling is an instructional strategy where the child observes a behavior of a teacher, of a parent, of a sibling. And then um, basically they're being shown or it's a demonstration of how to perform a skill. And um, then the child imitates it. So the mo model is actually provides an example of the behavior. When we teach, teach it, we intentionally model something um, that we want the child to imitate. But there can be times where there's, there's unintentional modeling too. And we do this sometimes as parents, we do this as siblings and peers. Um, and children tend to follow peer model, uh, adult models. So um, just, just keep it, be mindful that um, to model a behavior, a child needs to be able to attend to a model or pay attention to it, have the ability to remember what was modeled and they need to be able to repeat or um, the model to imitate it and be motivated to repeat the model. Um, and so, for example, if a child isn't really clear on imitation, you might have to teach them imitation first to then be able to model. And this is just some examples. On the left, we have unintentional modeling. And I think um, we, we all do different things in our home. And then we've got a guy that's doing road rage and a mom that's pulling her hair out and then some texting and driving and um, sticking our tongues out at each other. And, and so some of these behaviors that some of us would model um, that maybe we wouldn't want our child to do. And then on the right, we have things that we might want our child to do, right? As a family, we might wear helmets and a dad modeling how to, to tie or to um, button his shirt, his, his shirt and his child's shirt. And the mom is then teaching, you know, either cooking or cutting or how to prepare a meal. So this is great modeling behavior and then shaving on the lower right hand side. So the, one of the last things as far as the teaching we'll cover today is, um, the, is practicing the skill or behavior. So you and your child can practice together, maybe starting with you as part of the practice and then letting them practice in the situation on their own with giving feedback. He, he or she may not be successful the very first time, so, or even understand all the steps. So if you show them and model first and let them practice, you can prompt them to a correct response. Um, and you can also do a lot of reinforcing as far as their efforts towards, uh, towards um, uh, meeting that rule and the, and the efforts that they're making towards mastering that rule and skill. So this could be an iterative process when they gain greater confidence, they get more skills and they get more confidence and they can master this skill as they, as they continue practicing it. So it might take longer if there are several steps in the routine um, but just be patient and try not to get frustrated and just continue giving positive feedback for any gains. Try to avoid being critical in any way. We want the child to really, really remain motivated to master the skill. And if they're not feeling good about it, they probably aren't gonna continue trying it and, and doing it again. And in fact, it could even elicit some behaviors. So we just wanna to try to be really positive. Always, um, and always end on a positive note, maybe th saying such things like, um, awesome, awesome effort today on wiping up that cupboard. You did, um, you're, get, you're really getting there. You're doing a great job. So, and I just had illustrated on the right-hand side, uh, a visual for being responsible and cleaning up after lunch. So a mom could explain this to her daughter, um, going back to that picture, when cleaning up the lunch mess, this means um, these items listed, you know, we're gonna throw away things, we're gonna wipe up after ourselves, et cetera. So then after, you know, she could model um, the process for her daughter um, and then have her daughter um, practice, right? So mom could soak her dishes, the daughter could soak her dishes. Mom may need a prompt to get all the, the crumbs off the counter, but we can still recognize all the effort, other effort um, the daughter has made during um, the other steps. So I like the way you're using the cleaner and you got most of those crumbs, just a few left here and let's scoot them in the garbage. And but great job overall, I knew you could do this. So just really being positive about it. So this last is recognizing effort. Um, and again, this kind of goes back to that reinforcement and, and recognizing the efforts that our child, our children are making. So 
Um, we want them to repeat desired behaviors and we can encourage this through this verbal praise. This can be very motivating and even more, um, again, it's just so important when they're learning new skills and, and hard skills and, and so that continued reinforcement is important. We want them to become part of their habits. So when you see your child following a rule, acknowledge it. Um, when a task is finished or a rule is followed, use verbal recognition such as awesome, use of the word Sarah, great job staying focused on finishing your online work today, James. So other ways we can recognize is through hugs, fist bumps, um, high fives, or earning some sort of rewards. And like I mentioned, we'll be talking more about reward systems in our next uh, webinar and we'll get into that more. So, um, and then we want to just send, again, touch on communication with school. We talked last time about the importance of two-way communication with, with your school system. And this remains extremely important in your child's transition back. And, and, and now that they are back in some cases, um, uh, equally as important. So um, you can help with getting your child engaged at home and using electron, uh, technology and, and supporting the requirements at home, providing materials. Um, we can encourage uh, you to ask about enjoyable activities and educational activities to support learning in the home. So these are things that educators would have great insight to. Read all communications and respond as, as they're requesting. Communicate with your preferred form of communication, right? We talked about that last time and making sure that the school is aware of how you best communicate. Give your teachers enough time to respond as they're interacting with a lot of parents right now and really trying to accommodate a lot of children. So just be patient with that. Um, if you have any behaviors at home or need help, remember a discussion on setting up those routines and hopefully now with expectations and rules and then teaching some of those rules can help mediate some of those behaviors. But by all means, reach out to your school if you need help with this. And, and just remember that our teachers, you know, are in this field because they love children for, um, and they want what's best for your child and all children. So whether you're learning, they're learning at home or face to face or in a combination learning environment, um, it's likely, this is likely new for your educator too. Um, and so they're trying to adapt to this environment and maybe have their own challenges. So just again, be patient and try to be appreciative of what they're doing and communicate and let them know if there are things that you need or your child needs. So now we'll just uh, look briefly at next steps as we're wrapping up. Um, we want to encourage continued communication, like I just mentioned, with your school. Um, create expectations matrix. And again, this is kind of a call to action. So taking that um, template that um, several of the templates um, that Steph talked about and what might work in your home, um, look at broad expectations and rules in the chart and, and how does this look in your family. Think about uh, the rule, uh, maybe a rule you can teach at home. And, and how that's defined in your behavior matrix and what would be the best way to teach your child. And start with one and make it and, and see if you can get some success with that. And then you can expand from there. Um, we will be sending out some templates, including some of the ones that Stephanie referenced earlier. We came up with a pretty simple one with those core values. And again, those are just ideas. There's a lot of them, but it gives you a starting point if you're interested. Um, and then uh, a blank matrix and a sample matrix that's filled in. So um, we have one more poll for you to complete quickly. If you would just take a few minutes to do this or a minute to do this. Okay, so some people are ready to go. All right, and I think I can, but I'll need to review the materials. So please do. We really want you to review the materials. And if and I'm sure some people need time to process too. There's a lot of information we've covered in not only this session, but the last one too. So bringing that all together may take some time. And again, we encourage you to reach out to your schools and, and ask for help if you need help developing those things. So, um, so again, we're featuring a few of our resources and the Michigan Alliance for Families PBIS page and then the Michigan Department of Education um, page with uh, my MTSS link. 
and there are also an abundance of COVID resources, and these are um, being updated all the time. So take a look at these. If there are again great resources out there, and and uh, the Alliance has a lot of, of information also. Um, this is this is features the Center on PBIS, the family page, which includes materials, presentations, examples, and publications, videos to support families in understanding PBIS strategies at home. And also the Association of Positive Behavior Supports has, has a lot of resources for families too. On the left side um, is the note on Center for Parent Information um, and Resources. This is um, supporting families at home with PBIS. And this is a site for the National Parent Training Center. And on the right, we have the Center for PBIS Practice Guides where you can download information on supporting um, students with disabilities. And the following page is just is, is additional resources, some we've covered in the past, and there are a few new ones on there. And just a quick re-review and reminder that we have our last webinar on September 16th. We'll cover encouraging desired behaviors like Stephanie mentioned, and finding replacement behaviors, um, recognizing, reminding, and rewarding desired behaviors, and discussing, correcting, and reducing, and replacing challenging behaviors. So as with the first webinar, the session is being recorded and we will, it will be on the Michigan Alliance for Families YouTube channel and we will be sending a link uh, along with additional resources after the webinar within, within the next um, few days. So as we finish up today, um, we're gonna ask that you take another brief online survey and we really, really, really appreciate your feedback. This really helps us understand the value of the training that's being offered in areas that we can improve. We very much appreciate you attending today and look forward to the next session. We know this material may be new to some of you. Um, for some of you, it may, be, it, it may not be entirely new, but hopefully pr provide some additional information. And we hope that you can apply the information to your personal situation. And thank you so much for attending today. Thank you all.